Okay, so when dimensioning holes, you want to give the x and y value to the center of the hole and specify the hole's diameter. And arcs should be described as a radius. So when you have a small hole, the leader just can point to the edge of it. And if you have a small radius, the leader is, just needs to point to the edge of it like that. But if you have a large diameter hole or a large radius, it's usually better to place your, your leader lines and the arrows inside like this or inside like this and sweep the arc. And so if, if all you do is point to this with an arrow on this side and you don't have this in here, sometimes that, that note sort of gets lost. And so you have to make a decision as a drafter to say, okay, well, I think I want those arrow heads to be on the inside pointing out because I think that arc is large enough or that hole diameter is large enough, all right? And on small ones, just point to the edge like this. ASME specifies that cylinders and other outside diameters should be dimensioned to their profile or side view. So I'm not talking about holes here, but imagine that this is a stack of three cylinders, and this is the front view, and this is the side view. ASME says that those diameters should be given on this view and not this view over here. Now, if this were a hole instead of a cylinder, you could come out here and say what the diameter is. Let's say that's 0.75. If that was a hole, this would be perfectly all right but because it's a cylinder, we should dimension in the side view. So this is a cylinder here, so we need to put the diameter and what the, uh, the diameter symbol rather, and then write what the diameter is on each of those. This would be the correct way, according to ASME, to dimension these three cylinders that we have right here in the side view. An angle should be dimensioned in its profile view, so here's a couple of angular dimensions. And uh, angular dimensions, rather than tell us size, they tell us more about the orientation of a surface. All right. So this is so this is not so much a size and location dimension as it is an orientation dimension. Usually we're going to just label things as 30 degrees or 60 degrees, and then we'll have a tolerance, let's say a plus or minus one degree. But when we really want to break an angle down into uh, a more precise way of, of giving an angle, what we do is we take a degree and we break it down into minutes and seconds. All right, so look at this uh, notation over here. It says 59 degrees, 27 minutes, and 34 seconds. So these are minutes right here. So a minute equals 1 60th of a degree. So We've got 59 degrees, and then we take the, it's a little bit more than that, so we take that extra degree and we break it down into 60 parts. So this would be 27 of those parts, so it's not quite a half of a degree, right? So 59 uh, degrees, 27 minutes. If it were at 30 minutes, it would be a half a degree. So remember, there's 60, so we're at uh, 27 minutes. Then we can take a minute and divide it into 60 parts. So we have 34 minutes. So this is even a part of a minute, and a minute is a part of a degree. So I know it's a little, might be a little confusing, but it's something you should be aware of. Degrees, minutes, and seconds. And minutes are marked with just one mark like that, and seconds are marked with two marks. It almost looks like feet and inches, but in this case it's interpreted as degrees, minutes, and seconds. ASMEY 14.5 specifies that if you have an object or a part that's symmetrical, that means it's the same on both sides of its center line, it's, it's allowable to put this symbol right here and this symbol right here on a center line. And if you do that, for example, and you come over here and you say that the diameter of that hole is 0.625, if you do that, it is assumed that the diameter of this hole, because the part is symmetrical, that this hole's diameter is also 0.625. And so if you have symmetry marks, which are these two parallel lines like that, you would not need to write up here 2x. 
So what you have to do if you don't have symmetry, either you have to say 2x on this, or you have to put diameter 0.625 there, and you need to put diameter 0.625 over here on this side as well. With symmetry, we just say diameter 0.625 one time, and then that covers it on both sides of the symmetry line. Same way if we dimensioned uh, these angles right here, we could put dimension those on either side. We would not have to dimension them on the opposite side over there. Uh oh, I kind of marked through my notes. But it says that symmetry lines are 0.25 inches long. So you would draw a line 0.625 inches long. Uh, they're an eighth of an inch apart. So the distance there would be an eighth of an inch apart. And you want to assign a thick line type to them. So maybe 0.5 or 0.6 millimeters. And they are drawn at right angles to the center line and placed near the end of the center line and usually outside the boundary of the part. Dimensions that, that define the size and location of features on one side are assumed to be the same for the corresponding features located on the other side of the symmetry line. Uh, sometimes you have notes for drilling and machining operations, and so this is an example right here of what's called a counterboard hole. And so here's what the counterboard hole looks like in the top view, and here's what the counterboard hole would look like if we did a section view, and we cut our part in half along this cutting plane line right here so you can see what's happening. So let's interpret this. We have a diameter 0.75. That's the smaller hole and we can see that that one goes all the way through. So the distance from this side to that side of that hole is the 0.75. Then we have a counterbore symbol. And that this is our counterbore right here. And so it is a flat bottomed hole that has a diameter of 1.00. Then we have a depth symbol. It tells us how deep the counterbore is. This counterbore is 0.25 deep, okay? Over here we have what's called a countersunk hole, and that's a hole that has angled sides to this part that's drilled out here. So in the top view it will look like two circles. The larger circle is the countersink diameter. Okay, so the smaller circle that you see right here, that's a diameter of one and a half. That would be the distance from this side to this side there. That hole goes all the way through because we don't have a depth on it. Then we say, then it says to countersink this hole at a diameter of 2.00. So this larger circle we see right here would have a diameter of 2.00. And that's actually the distance from where this angled line begins here to where this angled line begins over here. That would be 2.00 by 82 degrees. The 82 degrees is the angle between these sides right here. If we measure that as an angle, that would be 82 degrees. Now on your keyboard, uh, obviously you don't have a symbol for counterbore, you don't have a symbol for depth, and you don't have a symbol for countersink. And so in order to type that, if we were using AutoCAD, we would type this note that we have right here, and instead of putting the countersink symbol in there, we would type a lowercase w. And then what we would do is we would highlight that lowercase w and we would change that font to the GDNT font. So all the other font in our note might be Arial, right? But then Arial, it's hard to write with a mouse, but just that symbol right there we would highlight. So it would be a lowercase w we'd highlight it, and then we would choose the GDNT font. And when we do that, the lowercase w gets swapped out for the countersunk or countersink symbol. If we need a depth symbol, right up here we would type a lowercase x right there. And for our counterbore symbol, we would type a lowercase v. Then we would highlight those, keep everything else at Arial, and change the text style to the GDNT font. Okay, so when the drafters finish dimensioning a drawing, they should compare the drawing to the designer's input and ask the following questions. Does the drawing provi provide all of the multi-views necessary to describe the object? Can each dimension and note included on the designer's input be accounted for on the final drawing? 
have all the applicable drafting and dimensioning standards been followed? Could this object be manufactured using only the views, dimensions, and notes provided on this drawing? When the answer to all the questions posed above is yes, the drawing is probably finished. In most cases, the final determination about whether or not a drawing is finished is made by an engineer or a designer or a checker, usually someone higher in the, uh, in the hierarchy of the, of the organization than the drafter or the CAD technician. So that's something that's good. Hopefully you'll have someone checking your work to make sure that everything is correct. So here's something that I stress to my students. When you're dimensioning a part, take, like, take a yellow highlighter, for example, and as you place your dimensions on the drawing, take the highlighter and highlight the dimension on the sketch. And then you can also highlight the one on the drawing one by one until all of them are accounted for. So what I do is I have my students take the sketch and I have them print out the drawing and then they go through and they highlight each dimension on the sketch. When they highlight this dimension, they go over to their drawing and they highlight it over here. When they when they highlight this guy, they highlight this one. And when they highlight that one, they do the same. They also do the same for notes and things like that. And so when the sketch is highlighted exactly like the drawing is highlighted, everything's highlighted, you're probably finished. So you should buy a highlighter and you should take advantage of it and use it. That's how you do it on a job. All right, so since this is a video, I can't open it up for questions, but I hope this helps you figure out uh, how to dimension parts a little bit better.